Welcome once again to the GEM Museum Zooming into GEM Season 2. And today is our second webinar for uh, this Zooming into GEMs. The topic is pearls, natural or cultured. And of course, we have Andrew who will be presenting to us and we are going to show you some gems, you know, uh, at the end of his presentation. So along the way, if you have any questions, just feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box, okay? The Q&A box. I will, um, I will disable chat while we are having the presentation so that, you know, uh, more focus. But you can still key into the Q&A box if you have any questions. Yeah, yeah. So Q&A box for questions, okay? So once again, I'm Hui Ying, he's Kuming, and we're the founders of the GEM Museum, and Andrew, uh, he's the curator. So uh, he, he will introduce himself to you later on, okay? <laughs> and for those who are new to, uh, for, uh, new to us, this is a quick, very quick introduction to who we are, Five East GEMs. And first of all, we actually uh, have a mother, like a business or company. Uh, huh? <laughs> Mothership. 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 Yeah. <laughs> it's our mothership. Fire Gem Lab, we do advanced gem testing. And of course, this is a UV base. We use it to test for synthetic diamonds. This FTIR, we use it to test for um, like treated jade or treated emeralds, for example. Yeah. And the EDX at the end. EDX yes. is very useful. And uh, later on, if we have time, we might talk a little bit about EDX for, um, for pose. Okay. It's, it's an important equipment to test for salt water and fresh water pools. It all started from the lab. My father started the lab and uh, he realized that uh, he really liked research. So that's what he's doing right now. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, of course with the lab, there is an institute. So where all our, inst all our uh, samples and all that uh, came from institute and the, the teaching learning also came from institute yeah. side. Yeah. So we run different courses. Oh, yeah. Next week, we have a JET course. So those of yes. you who want to sign up, please let us know. Yes. Uh, it's starting on the 19th of August. Yes. So when I say Friday, when I say Friday, just two weeks only, four sessions. And uh, eh, we missed out this. Okay. So this is my company, Fire East Gems and Jewelry. We are a company that uh, protects uh, the heritage of families. We help families continue the tradition and uh, talk about passing down jewelry to the next generation. This is what we help you to do. So you can always contact us about this and not just uh, engagement rings, but anniversaries or whatsoever regarding uh, repairs, refurbishing. We can do that for you. <laughs> like advertising speech. <laughs> we can do that for you. Come join us. <laughs> <laughs> and also the Fire Gems Import is a company that we supply gemstones to a lot of designers and jewelry, jewelry shops, people who want to focus more on the design and leave the gemology to us and uh, quality gemstones. And sometimes uh, we do receive orders about you know, making special pairs like uh, tourmaline in Azure card, things like that. So uh, yeah, feel free to approach me for any, any orders that you want to do for running a jewelry. Or if you want to start a business on gems and jewelry, do speak to us and we can uh, assist you along the way. Yeah, so a lot of our samples that we show in the webinar also, it comes from uh, Kuming's, uh, the company side there. It's because of this, that's why we have that, you know, that kind of extensive uh, samples that oh, we can yes. show specimen. Yeah. Okay, finally, we have the Gem Museum. So uh, if you are wondering when we are open, when we are going to be open, uh, somewhere around October, November, we just closed and we just uh, really fully closed and moved out of the retail shop. And so everything will be consolidated at Kandahar Street 26. Sorry, 26 Kandahar Street at the Gem Museum. And it's a heritage area. So if you are not in, from Singapore, you're not in Singapore. And if you have, have a chance to come to Singapore in the near future, hopefully, yeah, can do come and visit us over there. Okay. And uh, meanwhile, we are going to do some exciting things in September or so. So we hope that you will join us again. Yeah, we have some exciting yeah, things. Exciting things in store. Okay, this one, share with you next time. Yeah, share with you next time. Must zip first. Okay. Even Andrew also don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now, Andrew, uh, pass the time over to you. Okay, thank you, Koming and Huying. Let me share my screen. Okay. Hi, everyone. So, um, welcome back to our webinar session of Zooming into GEMS. Um, as Huying mentioned, this is our season two. And 
yeah, we have many regulars attend this year. And also not to mention uh, Happy Independence Day to India. We have a couple of very regular uh, attendees. Uh, they have been here since the beginning of our webinar. And yeah, today we are going to talk about pearls, um, natural or culture. So um, as you know me, my name is Andrew. Uh, wait, I can move my slide. Okay. So as you know me, my name is Andrew. I'm the curator of the GEM Museum, graduate um, from GIA as a graduate gemologist. Um, I remember every time in school, um, pearl is something that we don't really do research about, okay? Everything, um, what we do is gem identification, right? So as for pearls and opaque gem, there isn't a lot to look at, okay? We, um, we just briefly run through on the surface, the biofringence, the heft, um, and that's it. We, we would know that it's pearl, but we don't go too much details into pearls. So. I did not, I personally did not develop, um, I would say, a lot of love to Pearl because I don't really know much about them. So this, in this, um, today when we talk about Pearls, I did a lot of research and I learned a lot myself and passing the knowledge to everyone. So it's actually a win-win situation for everyone that is here. So let us begin the story of Pearls. And Pearl, is a very amazing gem okay it's made by nature uh, uh, actually made by a creature called mollusk it can either be an oyster or a mussel and the the ingredient that made pearl is you can't find anywhere else only found in pearl it's called nacre which i'm gonna explain later and pearl is actually one of the oldest ever gem of mankind, okay, yet. And this pearl is a natural pearl, okay, it's dated nearly 8,000 years old, even older than the history of mankind, the first history of a written um, um, history of mankind, okay. So this piece right here, 8,000 years old, and that period of time was actually the last stage of the Neolithic period or better known as the Stone Age. And this is the exact pearl. It's called the Abu Dhabi pearl because it's found off the coast of Abu Dhabi. And it's not huge. It's less than one centimeter um, in diameter. And you can see it has a pinkish overtone to it. And the surface is so beat up um, from 48,000 years ago. Well, you, you can expect a jewelry to be that beat up when, when it's that old, right? And this stone is, um, yeah, it's one of the kind. You can, you can say many other gemstone that is much older than this, but this gem is actually um, worn by humankind. You can say zircon is the oldest mineral on earth, ranging for more than 4 billion years old. Even diamonds are billions of years old, but this however, is actually worn by humankind. So it makes it the oldest gem to mankind yet. And pearl is very rare in nature. I'm talking about natural pearls. And ancient civilization often reserved these pearls for the privileged classes, for the rich, for the royalty, for the high-ranking um, officials, right? And because it serves as a symbol of status, um, when people wear it, they'll, people will know that, okay, this person is probably very rich or maybe they're part of the royal family. And ancient Romans, they actually take pearl very seriously, okay? Um, and other ancient civilization also use pearls as elixirs and cosmetics where they will grind the pearls into very fine powder to put it on their skin to make it a very pearly smooth skin or maybe put it into a drinks to drink it i'm not sure what would they become um, yeah that's what the ancient egypt the chinese do um, the indians they take pearl as a symbol of status all of these 
ancient civilization all highly regard to pearl. And what can you say about this picture right here? Is the fifth Qing emperor um, with his freshwater pearl necklace. And this is the actual picture of him wearing the exact um, pearl necklace on the right. So it is a very long pearl necklace. Of course, it has other gems to it. Uh, it has lapis, it has ruby, uh, emerald, and sapphire with it as well. And this was actually sold um, by the Southern Spee in an auction for, for millions of dollars, millions of US dollars to a private collection, collector. And how would they prove that this is the actual piece of this emperor? Um, uh, part of the collection of the jewelry. So basically, the picture says it all. Okay, everything is uh, the exact same thing from the. I'm, I'm sure someone would actually um, test it, right, for their authenticity. So, as a matter of fact, it is truly one of a kind piece, um, one of the historical pieces, as a matter of fact. And natural pearls, when we come to natural pearls, they are rare in nature because they are formed without any human intervention. They are formed by, they're actually triggered by tr irritants such as dirt or parasites. So mollusks, they are filter feeders, okay? They will go through the water by filtering um, through food or even dirt. So sometimes once in a while, dirt will get stuck or even parasite trying to bore through their shell into their fragile inner organs to, to reproduce. I don't know what the parasite uh, has to do with the oyster. So that's what happened when the mollusk try, will act, will use um, the pearl production, um, how would say, the process as a self-mechanism to get rid of the dirt or the parasite and make, eventually it made it into a pearl. So it's a very complicated process. And one of the most important source for natural pearl is the Persian Gulf. Um, it is before, it, is, uh, it has been an important source for a long time, even until today. And due to that, it carries a great significance to the Arab culture, particularly for Bahrain. Okay, this story, um, Bahrain has a rich history of natural pearl. Um, in fact, long time ago, there have been pearl, uh, pearl diving for, for uh, thousands of years, I would say, thousands of years. And they actually proud of their heritage, proud of their culture. And natural pearls were in fact, their main source of income uh, centuries ago, okay? A third of the Bahrain popular, uh, popu popularity were involved in pearl diving, where they look for pearl in the sea, natural pearls, in fact. So it gives uh, a very good source of income for the country. And that was in 1920s. Uh, unfortunately, that, during that period was the uprising of the culture pearl. Culture pearl was start taking the world by storm. And it really led to the, um, the slowdown in natural pearl industry. And what Bahrain did, the government actually banned the sale and import of culture pearl into the country. So they just want to continue uh, their heritage of natural pearl diving. And, and decades later, and I think 10 years ago, Around, around 10 years ago in the 2010s, 10-ish, okay, Bahrain, the government of Bahrain stepped up even more. They put in more effort into protecting their natural pearl industry by um, creating a project called Pearling Path. The, and the Pearling Path involved um, structures and like a historical path of the natural pearl industry of Bahrain. And in 2017, this pearling path project was um, became one of the uh, heritage world uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it, it is a very big thing. It really shows the Bahrain 
the Bahrainians, their, their culture and how proud they are in their natural pearl industry. So why Persian Gulf is so important for the natural pearl? Because the water conditions there are perfect for the oyster. The warm water really, um, really uh, introduce a lot of small parasites for the oyster to grow pearls. And the food is there as well. Um, not many, uh, I would say not, not much, um, the sea over there is calm, okay? It doesn't have any rough sea. It doesn't have any tycoons to interrupt the growth of the oyster. Um, thus, let's allowing them to thrive in the Persian Gulf. So uh, on the other hand, the cultured pearls are formed with human intervention. And this, and they can either be surgically induced with or without a bead nucleus. So a bead nucleus is the, a foreign matter that is surgically inserted into the mollusk, either an oyster or a mussel, for them to create the pearl. And if you're thinking without a pearl, without a bead nucleus, they would use mantle tissue to, to trigger the pearl production. So here's one of the photo that um, where they insert the beads into the oyster. So there will be a video after the slides, so it will be narrated by Kuming and Huying, so stay tuned. And this culture pearl started in the start of the 20th century in 1902, 1905. Uh, yeah, around that period. And the first person to do it is a Japanese man called Kokichi Mikimoto. It is a brand name now for a, a pearl company. Um, he, this, this man, he introduced, he is the first person to cultivate pearls, okay? Although he is not the first one to start the research on cultivating pearl, but he is the first person to successfully cultivate um, cultured pearls. So he, after his uh, success, he introduced cu the culture pearls into the trade, into the industry that actually revolutionized the pearl industry in the altogether. So some people call it the father, call him the father of the culture pearl. And as I mentioned, once he introduced culture pearl into the trade, it really uh, have an impact on the natural pearl. Um, industry. So because culture pro, they are much easier to, uh, to make. They are let, they're much more economical. Uh, people does not have to risk their life diving into open sea to look for oysters. And looking for natural pro is the chances are extremely low. That's why they are rare. So culture pro, it kind of transformed how the pro industry um, worked. Okay. So how would a structure of a pearl look like? They are a byproduct of the mollusk, okay? It's just to, um, to mitigate the effects of the irritant that is um, the foreign matter, as a matter of fact, by coating it with layers and layers of smooth nacre. So as you can see, um, this picture right here, it could happen in the mantle or the gonad of the mollusk. So this picture shows the mantle of the, of the mollusk. The mantle is just the underside of the shell and the gonad is the reproductive organ of the mollusk. It could happen either way. So this one you can see right here is it happened in the mantle and it has, the mantle is where the nacre, the smooth nacre, um, I would say produced, okay? And some, sometimes uh, pearls can happen in the shell, which what we call the mabe or the blister pearls. That is much low, they has a much lower value than compared to uh, pearls that, that produce in the mantle or the gonad. So what is nacre? Nacre is the organic product that is composed of microscopic platelets of aragonite, a crystallized form of calcium carbonate. 
some collectors they they would know what aragonite is um it's a cluster of crystal crystal okay it has uh, radiating from different directions it can it can be a, a collectible but this nacre is uh, microscopic aragonites um, and and then after these layers of aragonite they they are, will be bonded by concoilin a protein like um, secretion along with the aragonite crystals that forms the nacre so it's not just these three layers it has plenty of layers depending on whether it is a natural pearl or a cultured pearl and and the nacre actually uh, have an if impact on the quality of the pearl as well because the nacre is where you see the pearly luster that everybody loves the unique luster that only can be found in pearls so this is how it looks like inside of the pearl um, this is a cultured pearl okay a cross section of the of a tahitian pearl and you can see the bead nucleus is completely different than the nacre of the tahitian pearl tahitian they are famous for their black color and the bead they can be um, totally white depending on the quality this bead however it has the um, stripes uh, of, the, of the shell of the mother of pearl a good quality bead will be completely white so it will not um, show through the nacre and natural pearl they are a hundred percent nacre so even when you uh, dissect a natural pearl you will not see uh, anything inside the pro except for nacre so it will go all the way into the center whereas a culture pro bead you can see a bead nucleus um, that is surrounded by a thin coating of nacre so for the um, non-beaded culture pro i would uh, assume you will not see a bead nucleus as well um, it will go all the way through but uh yeah more of that later i have a slide to to how how would you tell a natural pearl a cultured beaded pearl or a cultured non-beaded pearl uh, further on in the slides so culture pearl they have many kinds of culture pearl produced by different kinds of oysters and mussels and one of the famous pearl culture pearl is the akoyas um, the akoyas is produced by the Japanese, thus the name akoya. And the scientific name of the oyster is the Pintada Fukada oysters, um, known as the akoya oysters in Japanese. So why would Japanese be the first one to cultivate the pearl? Because they are blessed with, uh, the surrounding seas are blessed with akoya oysters. Okay, The seas are inhabited by the akoya pearls. Uh, so they have they would produce okoya pearls and okoya pearls they have the highest percentage of spherical pearls uh, among all of the mollusk species so that's the, and the best okoya pearls they are white with rosé overtone with excellent luster so the best quality of okoya pearls can demand a very high um, high value and of course it ranges it depends on how well the pearls is developed and people like them because aquaria pearls they have they can match into strands of necklace because they have the highest percentage of spherical pearls so any other um pearls they varies in percentages so the next one is the south sea pearl they are produced by the Pintada Maxima oyster that lives in the Southeast Asia region, particularly the Philippines. So they are very famous for their color, okay? Before that, they, are, they have a softer luster compared to the Akoyas, but they are bigger in size. They are produced by the large oyster. That's why they are called Maxima. The, the word Maxima is referring to their size. And thus they can produce large pearls um, bigger than any other pearls 
And what makes them famous is because of their gold and silver color, depending on the variety of the oyster, be it the gold lip or the silver lip. So yeah, it ran the color ranges as well. It can be a creamy light, it can be a golden yellow, or, or maybe a orangey, uh, orangey pearl as well. And another famous pearl is the Tahitian pearls produced by the Pintada Margariti Fera black-lipped oyster. So the black lip, they will produce um, black color, uh, usually black color pearls. Also, they have other colors that range from the violet, the green, to blue, to even gray, as a matter of fact. So Tahitian pearls, they are produced in the French Polynesia in Tahiti, Tahiti. Um, not Tahiti itself. They are traded in Tahiti, okay? It's one of the largest islands in the French Polynesia. Whereas the pearls, they are produced by surrounding islands of the Polynesia, as well as islands in the Cook Islands. So, and then once they are produced, they will transfer to Tahiti to sell, to meet buyers, and that's why they are called Tahitian pearls. And there are many trade names to describe their colors as well. So um, interesting names such as peacock pearl on the left, top left, you can see um, two different tones, the pur purple on the middle and the green on the right. Um, the green one, some of them, they call it pistachio pearl, pistachio Tahitian pearl, and the blue, um, I'm not sure the blue, uh, this, this, these are the two names that I remember, uh, but in the end, the colors are just amazing to see, to look at. Lastly is the freshwater cultured pearls. They can be produced by many species of freshwater mussels. And the previous three, they are saltwater oysters, okay, that makes it very different compared to the freshwater pearls. And the main producers of freshwater pearl is the Hibriosis kumingi, known as the triangle shell in its native China. So China, uh, once they found, they found out the methods to culture pearl, they have been mass producing pearls because these muscles, they can carry up to 40 pearls at once. That is a lot compared to the previous oysters. They can carry two, uh, usually single single pearl at once. Um, they can carry up to three to five pearls. Um, this one they can carry forty pearls. The down the only thing is they they have the least percentage of being spherical, and one of the reason is because they use a non beaded uh, pearling technique. So Without the spherical bead nucleus, the pearl produced by the muscles will not have the, the shape of the bead to follow. So most of them, they are Baruch shaped. Um, Baruch shape means it doesn't have any symmetrical order to, to it. It's, um, they can be oval, they can be pearl, they can be pear, um, very rarely spherical. They can be ringed as well. So if you look at this, this pearl right here, you can see circular rings around the pearl. So that's what we call ring. And yes, they have been mass producing pearls, um, but um, it's really hard to match freshwater pearls into a strand of necklace like everybody love. They usually, people will actually take advantage of the Baruch shape in, to make it into something creative. Yes, it takes a lot of imagination to create something out of a Baruch shape. Um, when you go sourcing for a Baruch pearl, you must, you must um, how do I say, I have no talent in uh, designing jewelry. So um, uh, one of the most beautiful Baruch pearl design is they made several Baruch pearls into the shape of a rose. Um, they use the pearl as the petal of the rose. It is um, actually quite stunning, you know, but what are the chances to find those kind of 
uh, pearls. I mean, every pearls, they are one of a kind. Uh, same like any other gemstones, no two gems are the same. So when it comes to natural or cultured pearl, as a, in a consumer standpoint, uh, standpoint, it's really hard to choose um, depending on your um, uh, various factor, budget, preference, or anything. So natural pearls, they are extremely limited and very difficult to find. Like I mentioned, people have to risk their life to go to the open sea, some with equipments, some without equipments to find oysters. And the, the chances of finding pearl in a wild oyster is some would say um, one in 50, some would say one in 100 oyster, or some would say one in 1000, depending on um, their luck, okay? So they are extremely rare yet highly priced. Everybody love natural pearl in their possession. And due to that, a certain period of time over harvesting of these natural pearls of the wild oyster actually brought them in a certain region to the almost the brink of extinction. Well, but many efforts have stepped in. The government um, really put in a lot of effort into protecting their culture and protecting the wild oyster to begin their uh, reproduction and allowing them to thrive, um, thus preventing over harvesting. But in the end, over owning a natural pearl can be truly be a, a, a privilege to, to anyone, right? And this piece of uh, natural pearl um, is a very large pearl. It is not the largest pearl, natural pearl in the world, but it has a, a significant historical value to it. It's called the Hope Diamond. Uh, it's a 454 carat natural saltwater pearl. And as I mentioned last week, the Hope, uh, the name Hope is actually uh, owned by a very, um, I would say, well-known British banker slash merchant. Um, I think in the 17th to 19th century, he's a very powerful, very well-known merchant, banker, and a jewelry collector as well. He, he owned many of the famous jewelry, like the Hope Diamond, the Hope Spinel, and now this Hope Pearl. It's a Baruch shape and it placed a crown on top of it uh, to make it into a, like a pendant, uh, which is very unique by its own standards. So uh, yeah, it's very nice. So culture pearl, uh, they are indeed mass produced and the, the mass production has actually led to the prices of pearl to drop momentarily before regaining their value. Okay, and yes, they are more economical uh, compared to the natural pro in terms, to, in terms of value, um, in terms of the method of producing them. And, but still, there, a strand of matching pearl can be really hard to find. And um, a really well matched necklace can be valuable as well. So, in the end, it's really up to personal preference. And some per private collectors, they would often opt for the natural pearl for obvious reasons. And culture pearl, they can be really good looking and really classy in, in, in like for wearing for dinners or, or in any grand situations, right? So here it is, how to tell a natural pearl. Um, the most, there are many ways to tell whether it is a pearl or not, but it is very hard to tell a pearl for being natural or cultured. The most conclusive method is the X-ray imaging from a gemological lab. And X-ray imaging, they will actually show the bead nucleus and the nacre surrounding it. So the bead nucleus, you can see, is surrounded by the black shadow, okay? and the nacre uh, surrounding it. So back to the uh, non-beaded culture pearl. When an imaging, x-ray imaging shows, it will not have this one. 
this uh, spherical shadow of the bead. Non-beaded culture pro, it will only show like a piece, tiny piece of tissue, a, um, a squarish piece of tissue in the middle. So that is one of the um, proof that it is a, still a culture pro, but it's not a beaded culture pro. So uh, yeah, and one of my, uh, during school, okay, during school, back, back to school, um, my instructor, we are, we, okay, we are doing gem identification, right? We are trying to tell whether it is a pearl or not. And the instructor gave us a warning. Um, he, she mentioned that a method to, to know whether it's a natural uh, uh, pearl or not is by rubbing the pearl against your teeth which is really, really disgusting. Nobody did that because nobody wants to do it um, as the, the samples that given to us, the test has been touched by so many students. So nobody would ever dare to do it. Um, but I, I actually, she actually mentioned one of her past students actually did. So it would actually feel um, gritty compared to plastic. It would, well, a plastic would it feel smooth but better methods um, can help you identify whether it's a pearl or a plastic, such as the half. Plastic are really light, although it can look exactly the same like pearl, but the half shows a difference. Um, pearl, they will have a weight to it, and plastic, they will be really light, okay? So that is uh, one of my fun story in back, back in school. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Another way is by um, looking at a necklace, okay? Um, I've never done this before. They will actually roll the strand of necklace on a, on a piece of uh, a sheet of, I would say black paper. So they'll roll the bead of uh, strand of necklace and they will see the thickness of the nacre. So I would say it's really hard to see because uh, pearls are really small and sometimes you will miss a thing or two. So it better leave it to the experts, right? And the part that we all want to know how to judge a pearl, okay, regardless a natural or a cultured, okay? First, we all will look at the shape. There are many shapes. Um, of course, round being the most desirable being the most valuable and but it is the most difficult to shape. Other shapes like pear, barut, ring are also I would say quite prized depending on which hand they fall into. So the ring they can be quite unique as well. Uh, barut they can not just this this look they can be quite pretty as well. They can be flat, it can be like what I mentioned like a petal, a rose petal or a drop or, or a pear shape, which is um, very unique as well. It can be a pendant or anything you like. So the next thing is the size. Again, large pearl are rarer and more valuable. So um, yeah, not much thing to say about size. Uh, everyone knows about size. And the color, depending on what type of pearl you're having, Akoya, uh, South Sea, Tahitian, and of course they are, their color ranges um, in different tones and saturation as well. So you can have a rose overtone, you can have silver, uh, silver overtone to it. Uh, of course it depends on your color preference as well. White color being the most common one, but they can be uh, really good looking as well to match with any color of your dress or your, uh, yeah, whatever. So the next one, perhaps the most important uh, aspect of the pro judging is the luster. The luster slash the nacre quality. So these, this actually gives the pro um, their own unique pearly appearance, okay? And some, some of them, the nacre can be very good that it can, um, they can, um, allow the pearl to give out this phenomenon called the orient, a kind of pearl iridescence, the, the, the play of the rainbow colors. 
very soft, um, very faint rainbow colors on the surface of the pearl. So depending on the nacre quality, so the best nacre quality, the best luster is, some people may, uh, describe it as mirror light. So you can actually see yourself in, in a mirror uh, as if in a pearl. So the top right uh, represents the best uh, luster or the nacre quality of a pearl can have. Um, I'm not sure where they can, you can compare the second and the third, but the last one you can see is just dull. You cannot see anything. The, the shade of the, the shadow and the light is just all mixed up together. It doesn't have a, a distinct uh, separation between the two. So that is how a luster is judged. And the surface quality uh, re uh, refers to the absence and presence of blemishes such as scratches, abrasions, or pits. So best one, of course, is a smooth, all-rounded, Pearl, and different different people they will have um, different um, usage of the pearl. Some them some they are accidental, or some may not may not so accidental that can cause um, blemishes such as pits or scratches. And pearls they are quite soft, um, so they are easily scratched you can sometimes you can even scratch it by your nail so so it does really have to be taken care of and lastly uh, perhaps the most difficult of them all is the matching the matching involves uh, the uniformity of all the previous factors the color the size the shape the quality the nacre quality and the surface quality all comes together in matching so Imagine someone sitting here going through all of these pearls. It's just mind blown. Your eyes would just pop out. <laughs> so it's really a tedious work to match the a strand of the necklace. Um, but there is um, highly desirable to find a matching set of necklace, a pearl necklace, and thus the value of them of them are can be quite expensive as well. So. In the end, um, this video, I'm not going to play it now, which um, I'm going to pass it back. That's all for my slide, uh, actually. So I um, hope you learned something. I'm going to pass it back to Koming and Hui for them to narrate this Pearl Farm visitation by themselves. So uh, over to you, Koming and Hui. Wow. Wow. It's uh, very interesting. <laughs> so I'll just... Uh, Hang on, uh, let me, I have a lot of things open here. Mm, where is my, ah, here it is. Okay, so I'll just show you uh, uh, one of the trips that Kuming and I went. This was like 10 years ago, it was 2010. We went to Hanoi. Oh, 10 years already. Yeah. yeah, 10 years already. We went to Hanoi and um, uh, one of the few trips was to the Pearl Farm. Okay, so this is a quick three minutes video. We can show it to you right now. It was in a secret location. Secret location, yeah, because uh, of course they have to avoid pirates and all that. And at the same time, you notice that it's in between a lot of these high uh, islands, uh. I high islands, like very tall islands with very very tall rocks and all, because of the they the need currents. water to be very still. Yeah. Yeah. But yet they need current still, you know. Yeah, a little bit, not too much. Yeah. If not, you will wash off the the beads. So these are the oysters. And these are the cells for implantation. And you can see over here, she is actually just preparing the cells and cutting the cells into small little squares. <clears throat> and these antibiotics, make sure that the cells don't die. Yeah. Quite a surgical, like a medical process. Huh? Yeah. So now it's implanting the cell and then later on she will put the bead in. She put the cell first and she put the sorry, she put the bead in, then she okay, so she has to cut, okay, cut the tissue.
put the cell and put the bead. Okay, so this this uh, is called beading. Uh, the the pearls that come out of these oysters, right? They are called beaded beaded pearls. Just putting them back into like the nest. Yeah. Remember you? Did you buy it? Yeah, yeah. I bought. I bought it on the spot. Where's the pearl? Somewhere in the safe. <laughs> <laughs> I gave one to the our guide, and she was so happy. Yeah. <laughs> So this is a very kind of a me mechanical way of uh, culturing pearls, which is very normal. You know, every most pearl farms are like that. This but is a saltwater pearl. Until this is the harvesting. Oyster. So I bought this pearl. Because you know, this is the only, you, only way you know that it's from Vietnam and it's from the sea. So these shells are, later I'll show you the more exciting one, okay? This one's guarantee. You guarantee get pearls. Because <laughs> it's cultured pearl. Yeah. <laughs> of course, sometimes the oysters, they die early and the pearls doesn't really grow because of the condition of the water or maybe when they implant, it has contracted it's clean. some... Uh, yeah, not clean. They are infection and all that. Because these are live animals. Yeah. So these ones are... These are not... Later, I'll show you the more exciting one. <laughs> so these are oyster shells, okay? Uh, or rather, they are oysters. Beaded pearls, saltwater beaded pearls are usually cultured from oysters. Ah, this is the one I bought. I remember. I think so. Yeah, we bought the we brought back the shell, but we only brought back one side. So anyway, lesson learned: always bring back a pair, okay? Then you know. Okay, so let me where is the stop share. All right, so now before we, you want to show them pictures first, or you want to show them the these ones? Show them the pictures, ah. Yeah. Pictures first, is yeah. It? Okay, let me just close this. Very so last year, uh, Hui Ying visited Bahrain and went there for a pearl symposium. So she's going to sh show you some of her photos and videos on her trip visiting the pearl path, like uh, what Andrew mentioned just now, and also her journey of diving and getting pearls. Okay, so I'll share some funny things later. This is Bahrain. This is Windham. So I was staying here, and uh, this, is like a, this is a Four Seasons. This building is Four Seasons. So very nice buildings. And this is where I learned, this is the trading center. Or rather, it's, it's like the whole building is full of uh, different companies that's doing trading and things like that. And um, it's called WTC also, I think. Yeah. So this is how it looks like. Bahrain, very beautiful place. And over here, you see, uh, just like Andrew talked about the grading of pearls, right? So actually, natural pearls are graded slightly differently from the cultured pearls in terms of the color. So these are the natural pose. Okay, natural pose. Later I'll show you a video and close up, more close up to the pose. Natural means totally natural. Then they're, they're just like picked up from the sea, okay? Not the pose are the oyster, you know, found from the sea. This is an example of a beaded pearl, all right, from the Pintada Maxima. Usually Pintada, as the name suggests, is a really huge uh, oyster. It's a huge animal and then it, produces large, larger size pearls. So you can see the nacre is actually quite thick. And this is a 10.5 mm pearl. Uh, this is a cute one. This is a pearl with a, it's a beaded pearl with, we call it Mickey Mouse. Okay, Mickey Mouse Mickey pearl. Mouse. Yeah. So it's very difficult to identify this actually because it will look like it is natural, like totally mm. natural, natural. Until you do more testing, and uh, this one takes uh, experience because even, even actually x-ray may not be able to tell you. So um, what they do is they use CT scan. A CT scan is the CT last... CT scan, yeah, really? Yeah, you know CT scan the body for uh, your body, lah, right? For whatever tumor and all these things. So they use the same technology, CT scan, to scan the pole. Wow, okay. no yeah, wonder for, the... For the for the harder stones, for the harder okay. pearls that you know difficult to identify. Can you imagine uh, 
telling your wife, I'm going to the hospital for a CT scan. What for? Oh, I want to check the pearl, whether it's natural or not. Very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is one of the, the few trips after the class, after the course. The course is a five days course or something like that. I cannot remember. I think five days course. And uh, that's me. I think I'm slimmer now. <laughs> This is my teacher, Stephanos. Oh, He's a yeah. great guy. He's funny. And this is one of the um one of the trips that uh one of the one of my classmates brought me to one of the festivals, sea festival. So I was there and then this two Arab guy. Behind is actually their museum. They're they're old and retired already. But they have this whole museum of the whole journey of pearling. How all the different tools and, and you know uh the model of the ship and different different uh, things that that they use for pearling in the past mm. so he's they are the owners yeah and uh, this is after this is our loot after we went diving okay and uh, we have like uh, there are four baskets I think there were like four one yeah I think four baskets and total inside there there were probably about 300 to 350 oysters that, wow. that we picked up you might have have a feast. Yeah. So this is something that I saw at the Sea Festival. It's really, I think this is about uh, 20, uh, 20 inch. 20 inch, yeah. Yeah, it's about 20 inch necklace. It's all natural pearls. Huh? Yeah, all natural, totally natural. That means they're all open up from, uh, open up from the oyster and, and picked up, you know. They're all totally natural. And if you see my finger right here, right, it's really not that big. Usually natural pearls are very, very small. And at that time when I was there, they found an 8mm, oh, yeah, I think they found an 8mm natural pole, which is considered very big already. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. And Andrew mentioned about the... Purling path. Purling path. This is part of it. This is where we started uh, walking the purling path. And if you see this, this is actually a marketplace, was a marketplace. They built this for marketplace because people were staying around there. And later on, I'll show you the entrance, okay? Entrance now is the exit, actually. So now they're actually remodeling this place for the purling uh, path. And um, it's not totally completed. And there were like little sort of cubicles. They're not so small, they're quite big cubicles. And those cubicles are where people are selling things, you know, selling food, selling drinks, selling vegetables and things like that for the people, for the merchants who are working there, for the people who are doing pearling, pearl fishing and all that. So right now, because Bahrain is a very small island like Singapore, they have a lot of land, a big part of Bahrain is reclaimed land. So Ooh. at the end, yeah, at the end of this, this whole stretch of marketplace, right, they, uh, it was the, the place where they, uh, yeah, they do pearling and now it's being reclaimed. So this place has been abandoned because no use really. There's no trading going on around this area. But of course, the history is still there. It is our guide and all the... Wow, he looks people. serious. Yeah, he's a serious guy. And of course, we had our reception and all these things. Like drinking their Arab tea. Quite nice. Huh? So this is the supposed to be entrance in the past. So now it's become an exit. And you see now the land behind here, it's all been reclaimed. They're all reclaimed area. Yeah. So use that, that part used to be the sea? Yes. Oh. Yeah, nearby. Like correct. East Coast, huh? like Singapore East Coast. Ah, uh, yeah, correct. Used to be the sea. Yeah, so this is the, the UNESCO World Heritage Site as uh, Muharrab in Muharrab, Bahrain, as Andrew has mentioned. So if you go Bahrain, it's a very nice place and uh, very friendly people and all that. Not so, uh, you know, uh, it's not an oppressed place like people think you know, Middle East and all that. They're very advanced. Okay, and the uh, Bahrain dinar is very expensive. It's more expensive than euros. It's more expensive <laughs> than, it's like one sing dollars to 3.5. No, sorry, one Bahrain dinar is 3.5 sing dollars. Wow, it's, it's higher times. than the British pound. Ah, uh, yes, yes, much higher. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so this is the pearling, pearling path all the way to the end. I think the marketplace was somewhere around in the middle part over here. So it's a long stretch and we didn't walk through the whole thing because it's a very, very long stretch. And then with the guide talking and people asking questions, it's, it's, it will take a few days actually. Yeah. Okay, so these are the pictures. And then... Uh, I'm going to enable the chat. Enable the chat. 
Oh, sorry. Okay, so I've enabled chat. So if you want to chat with us, you can chat with us. <laughs> okay, so you want to show them sure. something first? Before I go on to the some more videos. Yep. So what? Yeah, so he's setting up the share. Yeah. Okay, so what you see here is actually uh, an oyster shell. And you turn it you turn it around. Okay, it's labeled Japanese Mabe. Okay, Japanese Mabe. Okay. And the Mabe means it's it's like it's stuck to the to the shell. Right, so I have this one also. You can show them. <laughs> this is an interesting one. This is a Chinese one. So you, you go to some of those places, marketplace, you see this kind of uh, wow, amazing thing, right? You know, it's a miracle. Something happened. Indeed, something happened. You might want to turn it around and tell them what happened. So very intelligent Chinese people, they carve um, an image on wax and they implant it into the, this is not oyster, this is muscle. Okay, muscle, M-U-S-S-E-L. They implant it into the muscle shell. So you can see that part yeah, this is actually wax. This one, this, yeah, this thing is, is actually wax. Yeah, so his father actually knocked off the backside and then found out that it's wax. So it's, uh, this is how, you know, a very innovative human beings, you know, manipulating nature. How about this one? It's yeah, so this cool. one is, uh, yeah, yeah, it's very fragile because this is, the, this is one of those shells that Oops. I picked up from the sea in Bahrain. Yeah, and you can see this is totally natural. This one, okay. Don't move, don't move, don't move, don't turn around. Ah, okay. So you can see this portion here. Let me zoom in. Yeah, you can zoom in a little bit. Okay, this portion here, you can see the shape is a bit off and everything, right? It's because actually uh, what happened was that parasites, the sea parasites came and, and attacked the oyster. So when it attacked the oyster, there's injury to the tissue and it starts to form the nacre. Okay, nacre. You cannot call them pearls. They're not really pearls. It's just nacre. And you can see it's a huge parasite that is there. Okay, you turn it around. Wow, very, it around. very no. carefully. Yeah, it's no, very, because it's very fragile. Very fragile, very fragile. You turn it around and then you can see this, this holes here. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So these are all areas where the sea parasite attack the oysters. Uh, oysters. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And of course, uh, we have more things to show. Uh, so here I have... Okay, so these two, they use the red, red cloth to keep the pearls. Okay, so this is a tradition. You ask me why red, I ask them why red, they also don't know. It's a tradition. And apparently red makes the pearl looks better. Yeah. So that's why they use red. It's like uh, when we sell white diamonds, we use a black background, right? Then uh, for pearls, they use the red little cloth. It's just red cloth. Yeah, just like that. You can throw them inside here. Oh, yeah. The zoom box. Yeah. And you just use See? the cloth to tie it up. Yeah. Can I open it? Uh, you open, no? Is there anything it's inside? Just, uh, nothing. It's just nothing. Oh, okay. I thought there's a pearl inside. <laughs> no, nothing. No pearls. Imagine in the jewelry shop, you see this in the display. Can I have one of those? <laughs> it, hey, open it, it's a pearl. So Amazing. nowadays, people don't really use that. Uh, only in Bahrain. Okay, Bahrain is the only country in the world that pro that produces, uh, no, that uh, trades, or rather they, they are not allowed to sell cultured pearls. Okay? So if you're a merchant, you go there and you try to sell cultured pearls, you will get caught and you will be put in jail. So this is how serious it is. Okay, Abu Dhabi produces uh, natural pearls, but they also have cultured pearls. So, so um, uh, Bahrain, they want to preserve the culture. That's why they, it's very, very strict over there. And every pearl uh, they sell must be certified. So if it is, uh, not really. Uh, so anyway, if you go there and buy pearls, you must make sure that it is, getting, it is certified pearls. Okay, so I'm just going to show you some pearls that we got certified. Okay, these are natural pearls, okay, natural ones. And oh, look at that. So beautiful. Okay, so this is how the certificate out. looks like from Dana. Dana, Dana means pearl. 
Okay, dana means pose. <laughs> so the T is the plural. Okay, dana means pose. Right? Whoa. And yeah, it's very, very, it's very small. And I bought this from, Just about. from one of my classmates. He is a pearl diver. I mean, uh, yeah, he's Look a diver. That. So cute. Yeah. So I hand. found that natural, totally natural pearls, right? They are very, uh, the luster is nice and very pretty. Yeah, very beautiful. See? Yes. Although they are small, but it's very nice luster. And it's kind of like a little bit of a translucency there. You know, and are you able to zoom in more? Oh, they're really small. Yeah. Oh, look and, at that, so nice. Yeah, over here, okay, it says that it's a saltwater pearl and they also give uh, the identity of uh, no, which, oh, let me show, show which, them. Um, which animal so this is the being found. Like, it's Dana micro cut report. Pearl yeah. origin, Pintana. Yeah, Pintana. And then the natural pearl. It's very important. Yeah. So this is the big version of their big version of like the this. certificate. Okay, big version of the certificate. So let's show them why oh, I better put the pearl back into the Yeah, so um uh I I we don't have a lot, we only have a couple of these and they are actually for sale. Uh. Those that are not for sale are those that I I opened and I found them. <laughs> I show you the okay. So this is one of give me the cut, please. Oh okay. Sorry. Thank you. I'm going to show them. Yeah, I want to show you one more, which is called the blister pearl. Okay, how blister pearls look like. Natural blister pearls. Okay, natural blister pearls. This is how natural blister pearls look like. Yes, they use red cloth to grade and show pearl. Yeah. Salt water, they are all salt water. This so this is blister pearl. You take out and show them why is it blister. The blister pearl are pearls that is like a blister on the shelf. Okay, at the, at the bottom of the shell, it's like a blister. So you can see over here, yeah, you can see that it's blister. It's like there is a layer of nacre, but it's, it oh, is there, not there, cultured. There. Okay, they are natural. It is not cultured. It's natural and it's, it's blister because it's stuck onto the shell. So what they do is that they, they cut it off, they, like they kind of like saw it, saw it off. Yeah. yeah. So it's different from Mabe, you know, it's similar but it's different. Okay, Mabe is cultured. Blister is natural. Okay. Okay. So this one is certified also. This one is certified. Yeah. Okay, so now I'll show you some videos very quickly. Which one first? Okay, I'll show this first. Okay, so this is this is the uh, row is the classic colors in Bahrain. I like this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a rainbow it's color. It's very nice. I'm sure they have plenty. So the the classic colors. These are all the classic colors. Okay, one more time. Row right. is the first row. Colors these are the classic Bahrain. colors. I like this one. This is expensive. If you have one whole necklace of pearl, that color is very expensive sure because plenty. that's the rare color. How, this one is the rare. How much one. is it? I mean, let's let's ask our viewers. Have you all bought cultured pearls before? Uh, how how much do you pay for a pearl? Maybe a pair of earrings, or a pair of, or a ring, or maybe a necklace. Anybody want to share? Anybody of anyone bought a pearl necklace before? Cultured pearl necklace. How much do you pay for it? Well, you know, um, just now Huying showed uh, uh they showed this this. Okay, so. Okay, so this one. None of them look actually, the same. They are all <laughs> natural pearls set with not diamonds. Not one pearl was the same color. And, uh, if I'm not wrong, this is. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the gold is. Uh, I don't know, twenty k, maybe twenty k gold. So these are all natural poses. The whole thing natural poses, natural poses. Okay. <laughs> so this guy is a diver. He's a diver. So a, he uh, dives and then he collects all these poses and he makes into a set of jewelry for his wife. So sweet, right? <laughs> okay, so he made this set of jewelry for his wife. And um, okay, the thing about this kind of set, uh, we think it's very, very expensive. Okay, it's not that cheap. But then, 
what is most rare and most uh, va uh, valuable in a sense is make is the is when the poles are of a consistent color and of a rather consistent shape. Okay, uh, size can be big, can be small, doesn't matter. But then can be must be consistent color and consistent shape. Because sometimes the shape is a bit off. Most natural poles, the shape are all off one. It's very difficult to find super round ones. Okay. Yeah, so this is another example that I'm showing. Okay, and uh, now going to... Okay, before I show that one, I show this first. So this is at the Sea Fair, Sea Festival, and they have like baskets of oysters. And they say, okay, you pay one Bahrain Dina and I will open three oysters for you. So if you're lucky, you get some pearls from the from the three three uh, uh what do you call that oysters. The oysters. So, so I tell you first like, this one don't have. <laughs> so I say just now at the Hanoi right, everyone you open sure have one. This one no no guarantee you know no guarantee. Yeah. Up. The moonstone is no, the one on top. I think is scapolite. I don't think it's moonstone. Yeah, don't have. So I pick. Don't have. And they actually have competition, you know. They have competition, um, oyster opener competition. No, like it's for all the divers. So if you're a good diver, right, the oysters that you pick, right, you have a higher chances of getting pearls. No, so they have competitions like this. So you have one basket, right? You dive and one basket. And then during this period of time, you okay. how many you can open and then how many pearls you can find in those oysters shells. Yeah. So this is too bad for me. Okay. Actually, it's really pretty fun. Uh. Okay, next one is uh, here. So this is me. This is me over here, I think. Sorry, yeah, it's yeah, a bit yeah, giddy, you, you know. You know? This, is, this is actually me. I think I go from here. Ah, there. I'm here. And he's another scientist from... Uh, Jai. No. I'm no? <laughs> Swan. Swan. Where is he from? Uh, Finland, is it? Finland? He's a scientist from anyway, Europe, somewhere. So, so the funny thing is, my husband asked me if I picked up any oysters shell, right? I can tell you that I never. <laughs> I pick up zero, okay? Oh, we get 300 oyster shells in those baskets, right? <laughs> Someone else picked up. Yeah, and uh, I because I was snorkeling and I, I was a bit uh, floaty, you know? <laughs> I floated. I couldn't really go down. It's about three meters deep. I thought I could. I couldn't. I, I went down. I almost touched the shell. Okay, so the best shells to pick up is those shells that is about like um, three finger wide. This kind of size. Okay, like for example, that one. You give me the shell there. Yeah, this size. You can see this size. About this size. These are the yes, best yes. shells to take. And uh, so they are quite small and they are really stuck into the seabed. Stuck into the seabed. But it's only 3 meters, 2.5 2 to 3 meters deep only. I was floating so much, I, I couldn't get in. You know, it was so funny. So we had like, um, uh, we had people who had the tank and they were underground, I mean, underwater the whole time, for, for the whole time, like almost an hour and all that. So they were the ones that picked up the 300 oysters. Oyster, yeah, oysters. Okay, so this something funny in a way <laughs> so with that we went on to open some shells yeah, I started already very windy very windy and uh, hoping that hoping that I will get some I will, I will find a pearl in this shell and I think you would have guessed, right? Yeah, so at the beginning you feel very sad for the oysters. After a while you are like, you are not producing pearl for me to get it. You <laughs> throw them back into the sea. But I can tell you, some people they feel very bad for the animal. However, these oysters are actually 
pests in the seabed, yeah. okay? And um, it's good to do pearling. If not, they will invade the whole seabed and destroy the seabed. Yeah. Wow. Yes, correct. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So to uh, actually maintain the ecosystem, doing no, pearling is so. actually important mm -hmm. for them. If not, if it invades the whole seabed, right, the oysters cannot grow continually in a sense. Yeah. So this is something, so as I mentioned, you know, um, the Hanoi one is open one, you get like maybe five pieces. So you open five, also don't have one, one pearl, right? Yeah, and so what did I get at the end? Let's have a look at this. So these are the pearls. These are the shells that I found the pearls, okay? So I, I took home, I brought them home. You can see it's right over here. Yeah, right over here, the pearl. Okay, so this one has got one. And there's a little, little, uh, like it's a blister, pearl. but it's not really blister. It's more like a mabe, okay? And then another last one, just the last one. Okay, so this last one. Let's see. This one has got three. I think three. Two or three. But they're really, really small. I see that. Very small. You see, it's right over here. This one. And this one. Oh, there, there, there. Two. Yeah, two and then one more over here. Yeah, this one has got three. So I strike jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> and I took back the three. I'm going to show you the three pieces under the zoom box now. You see, this this is really tiny one. This is really tiny one. Yeah, just be careful. It's very, very small. You see, one, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah, they look big, but they're really tiny. Okay, I took back the oysters uh, with the meat and everything. But I, I didn't eat them. It was very smelly after a while, you know. The, the seafood oh. smells very smelly. Okay, Ooh. let me go to the zoom box right now. There you go, these are the three pieces. They're really small, but they are very beautiful because you see the colors are really white. The smallest one is not much luster because not enough nacre. Not there's not enough nacre uh, on the smaller smallest piece. Wow. But they are very white. They are very white. And and this one, the one in the middle, is a classic color. It takes it's a bit creamy, cream color. It's a classic color. This is more white. Yeah, and I also found another one. I found one more. I was opening shell because I didn't pick up any oyster, right? I felt bad. I was I was opening shells throughout the whole trip back to back on land. Yeah, and this is another one that I found. The golden one. I opened it. Ah golden pearl. Wow. It's a brownish, golden brownish pearl. Okay, this one, the luster is not as good. The luster is not as good, but of course, it has color there. Yeah, it's a golden brownish color. Okay, so on one side, on one side is a, a bit uh, like stained, stained. Uh, it's stained lah. That means it, it's 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 a bit darker in That's color. Really you can wash see. it. Yeah, and uh, it's not round. Of course, it's all off shape. It's off shape. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so that's about it for today. We do still have, we do, we still, you want to show them some of this, this one. Okay, so just a quick one. This is a sample that we made, okay, of the different type of um, bead that is used for culturing pearls. So you, you may ask, do we have like pearl courses and all that? Actually we do, we already have a pearl course that is uh, prepared. It's a one day to two days course, including like grading and things like this. But uh, we haven't officially launched it yet. Uh, but if you, are if you are interested to join us for the pearl course, you can always let us know. Um, the course was planned for uh, an in-person class 
uh, classroom style course. But then uh, because of this COVID and all that, it's, there's a lot of like um, uh, rethinking, you know, how you can run. The glass bead duster looks better. Yeah. Glass compared beat. to the shell bead and the uh, plastic bead. Oh, wow. Is it? Yeah, you see, oh, okay. it's really much shinier. Yeah. But the chances of the oysters dying also very high. La, because it's glass. Yeah. Yeah. So this one, this set is the uh, freshwater pearls. This is the old, older ones. This is uh, probably year 2000 and before. They are more like rice. Rice. Rice, uh, rice green. Okay, yeah. so that's all we have for you today. Uh, any questions from the, the audience? No! No questions? Sorry about the kids at the, <laughs> at the back. <laughs> okay, no questions. I will just do let you know that uh, okay, just very quickly, our next zooming into jam is ornamental jams. We talk about turquoise, malachi, and um, lapis. Lapis, yes, yeah. lapis, turquoise, malachi, yes. Okay, and once again, we're going to have like many different samples to show, right? Okay, I think our webinar, our zooming into jams for one hour become one and a half hours, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Too many things to show, you know. Yeah, anyway, uh, next week onwards, we're going to have uh, four days of jade classes. So if you're a Singaporean, oh, not Singaporean, also can join it. We have some Australians who, have, who are joining us for this class. It's a jade fundamental. And uh, for Singaporeans, we have, we have funds. You have a few skills future credit that you can use. Okay, you can register via this website, firesgeminstitute.eventbrite.com. For the ornamental gems, uh, zooming into gem series, you can actually uh, sign up at our website itself, okay, the gemmuseum.gallery. So we have a page over there, events page, that you can sign up for the zooming into gem series. So, yes, let me see. Okay, thank you, Gaurav. Thank you for always joining us. You know, uh, we, we, we appreciate your joining us all the time. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see any questions. Yeah? Andrew, do you have anything you want to add on? No. Uh, but someone did ask for the price for the natural pearl. Oh, price for natural pearls. Okay. Price for natural pearl. Which one? Uh, in Sim. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, which, which one? Price for natural pearl. Price for natural pearl. Well, a price for natural pearl, like if you saw just now the... Uh, Let's say this one, right? I don't remember the price, you know. Oh dear. If, let's say... Yeah. If you want to buy, let's say, a 12mm uh, culture pearl, let's say it's a culture pearl, it's slightly off shape. A 12M culture pearl could be about uh, maybe a thousand dollars to to five thousand dollars. That is 12MM. If you have a natural pearl that's 12MM, it could be easily maybe a, about fifty thousand dollars, fifty to eighty thousand dollars. 12MM. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. It's very very rare. You know, and uh, okay, so for the certificate itself, uh, just the, the, the first piece that we showed just now, the 0 0.52 carats, the certificate itself is about $46, just the certificate itself. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and of course, just the certificate only, you haven't included like shipping and things like this. So if you want to get your pearl tested here to check whether it's like totally natural. I know of some Bahrain, uh, Bahraini, uh, pearl merchants they come down to Singapore to sell their pearls so if you want to be very very sure you um, they are the most uh, recognized for testing pearls. natural pearls okay testing natural pearls because of the fact that in Bahrain they only can sell natural pearls so all the pearls that go in their experience for testing natural pearls is is top in the world I would say la. okay 
So this is this is just the certificate alone. Forty dollars doesn't sound like it's a lot. The pearl itself, if I am not wrong, it's about. Uh, I remember maybe. <laughs> I don't know to give you a false hope, you know. Wow, so cheap. <laughs> $300 or what? I, I, I cannot remember. I cannot remember. I need to go and double check it. Yeah. But the price is quite different because um, natural pearls are smaller. Just remember, natural pearls are smaller. For, the, for two pearls that's of the same size, right? Cultured pearls that is this size, okay, for the same price, for natural pearl will be only very, 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 very tiny. Okay, so this is the kind of idea that I can give to you. So like for example, the, 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 the three strand necklace, uh, that's about, that's about, I think in Singapore, you probably get it for, I don't know, 80,000, 100,000, probably somewhere around there. Yeah, correct. Some equipment to show us. Oh, the EDX. Yeah, okay, okay. I cannot show you the EDX, but what I can tell you is that the EDX can test for fresh water and salt water pearls. Okay, the EDX. Okay, let me just show you the, our equipment, EDX. Okay, so... Uh, Okay, so this is the EDX. So EDX, we can use EDX to test the chemical element of the material. So fresh water will have more of the uh, strontium, no, manganese. Okay, fresh water and more manganese. And the salt water will have the strong SR. SR is tin, I think it's tin, yes. yeah. Correct. So this is how we can, one of the ways to separate fresh water and salt water. Okay, but then this is not the method to separate natural and cultured. Okay, natural and cultured, the best is X-ray, like what Andrew said, and or CT scan. CT scan. Yeah, CT scan is the serious stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, so in the Bahrain lab, right, Danat, they have the luminescence, X-ray luminescence, photo, photo luminescence, they have the CT scan, they have... Um, uh, EDX also, yes, EDX, RF, they are all X-ray machines. So this is the, there are different steps that we do to, for testing the, the um, pearl material. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Hope you enjoy yourself. If you like it, uh, please join us for the next session. And uh, so see you next week and uh, take care. I think uh, Andrew will be sending out a uh, an email to ask for some feedback. Uh, please do give us your feedback and uh, we hope to do this together with you all again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye.